Hello, everybody, and welcome to TeacherCast, your home for all things professional development. Thank you so much for joining us today and making TeacherCast your home for your PD. My name is Jeff Bradbury. Welcome to show number 124. Today we're talking all about coding. We are here in the middle of the Hour of Code, a week-long celebration of all things coding and programming. We have a great lineup today. I want to bring on our co-host from the Tech Educator Podcast, Mr. Sam Patterson. Sam, how are you today? I'm doing great today, Jeff. You just can't beat a day where six 3D printers show up in the middle of the day. You, you had what, Sam? Uh, in the middle of the day, my boss wheeled in six Polar 3D printers, and he said, so you're going to get these up and running today, right? And what was amazing it was I actually did. That is pretty, pretty cool. What are some of the things that you can do with a 3D printer these days, especially six of them? Well, with six of them, I'm hoping to be able to scale up to the point where we can actually do things like have the art class design stamps that they use to build tiles. Um, today, our test print was thematic and timely, but not revolutionary. We printed a dreidel. That's to really be fair, cool. we tr printed a dreidel. It has a little droid head that goes on top. It's not done printing yet. I, I have to ask the question, was that the dreidel you were looking for? So today, Sam, we're going to be talking all about coding. I want to bring on our other guests and our guest of honor tonight. I want to bring on from the great state of Connecticut, Mr. Rob Pennington. Rob, how are you today? I'm doing well. How are you, Jeff? Doing well. Tell us a little bit about yourself and some of the great things that you're doing in your neck of the country. So uh, I'm 7th and 8th grade teacher. Uh, I also am the tech coach at my school and also the tech coach for the district. We have a lot of great things going on uh, this week. Our makerspace is up and running. We have students that are actually playing with Sphero. That's been our uh, big hit this week. And was Sphero the droidal you were looking for? <laughs> I got to get me some sound effects for this show. Also on our show today, uh, for the first time, Mr. Kevin Donatello. Kevin, how are you today? I'm doing great, Jeff. How about you? I am doing fantastic. Tell us a little bit about yourself. I'm a fifth grade teacher. I uh, teach math and social studies and language arts, and uh, I'm just diving into the tech world and very interested in coding, especially during this week. Uh, I know my students are doing it with Minecraft and Star Wars, and uh, I'm just dying to know more about it. There are some great things that are happening this week for the Hour of Code. One of the things that people are using all throughout the world in more than... 150 countries in more than 40 languages is a great platform called Scratch. We are fortunate enough to have one of the lead designers from the MIT team working on Scratch. I want to bring on the show today, uh, Kasia Shimalinski. Kasia, how are you today? How are things? Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm doing well. How are you? Doing well. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, I'm the product lead on the Scratch team. Uh, and Scratch is an online programming language and a community for kids 8 to 16 years old, and we're globally, like what you said, uh, in 150 countries, over 40 languages, uh, and we're really psyched about Hour of Code. So thanks for having me. Thank you so much for being here. You know, all throughout my district, all throughout districts across the world, really, Hour of Code is something that you just can't get away from. Students are coding. I, I walked into a kindergarten class today and we did some really basic coding activities with these kindergartners. Why is it important for kids to learn how to do coding activities? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really good question. Um, at MIT and on the Scratch team, we really think that coding is a new form of literacy. And what we mean by that is that in the same way that we learn to read and write to be able to express ourselves and not necessarily to become a writer, we believe that the next generation of kids is going to have to learn how to code uh, just in order to be able to express themselves. And so we really see coding as a, a vector and a tool for creativity and self-expression. Well, I, I, I want to go back a couple things here and, and open this up for everybody here. Let me ask a couple um, questions from the point of view of a teacher who might not know a lot about this. If I say I'm going to teach my kids coding and I say I'm going to teach my kids programming, am I talking about the same thing? It really depends on where you're standing and who you ask. Technically, you can do a lot of computer programming activities that aren't actually coding. If you get to a real stickler about language and what it actually means, 
then you can drill down to the fact that many people when they talk about coding are talking about doing the actual work with machine language to encode the pieces of computer code that become the programming language the rest of us use. But coding sounds cooler, so it's all good. <laughs> Hour of code. So if I, 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 I think I'm following what you're saying there, Sam, but if, if I'm just talking to my administrator and I say we're doing coding in the classroom and I say we're doing programming, is if there... your administrator doesn't have a degree in computer science, they won't know the difference. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Now, I, I, I want to get back to Scratch here. Tell us a little bit about Scratch. What is it? How did it get started? And, and, and how did you go from working in MIT to 150 countries? Yeah, well, um, it's pretty exciting, and uh, the growth has been, I think, part of a larger growth that's happening across the ecosystem, so it's not just us. Um, the program really started uh, many, many years ago as part of a philosophy around um, computational reasoning and children and the ways that we can build tools to help kids gain access to these kinds of skills. Um, but Scratch itself started uh, in 2007 as an offline program, so something that ran on your computer, uh, and then a separate online community. And in 2013, we rolled out a new version that actually puts those two things in the same place, and that's at scratch.mit.edu. And now kids can create projects and also share them using a, a really kind of simple block-based programming language where you kind of drag blocks on the screen and snap them together to make um, characters do things. Uh, and they can make those projects, and they can make games or animations or stories, and they can share them into an online community. You know, it really seems like a program like Scratch can allow a kid to have an idea and really put down that idea onto their computer and make make video games, make things happen. Rob, let me bring you in here as a tech coach, as somebody who's working around the district, what kind of activities are you seeing happening this week on the Hour of Code topics? Well, we have elementary schools that are really starting to just, you know, get kids just starting at the entry level. Uh, one of the best projects that I had last year for Genius Hour was a student who used Scratch and created this whole game and then we had the opportunity to play her game and just to see students make their games critically think problem solve throughout the the process it's such a great opportunity for our, our students and, and what are you doing as a tech coach to introduce this? Because, you know, I, I can see you going into a, a, a classroom, a, a school, and saying, it's the hour of code, let's drop the curriculum and do these things. And having a teacher go, wait a minute, whoa, 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 uh, whoa I'm busy, it's, it's, it's the holidays. How do you introduce these concepts to your teachers to kind of get them to try this stuff? Well... I think that the first thing that we have to do is we have to build relationships with the teachers. Um, we also need to support them and really show them the why. They're not going to buy you know, just what we're doing. They want to know why we're doing it. And I think that that is if we can really show them and when the stu if you're there to support them and when students get so excited for it and they're building and creating, it's such a great opportunity. And I think that that really is the key with teachers when we're working with teachers is really just trying to support them, show them the why of 21st century learning because I think that that's the key. Now, Sam, I know you're in a position where you just got done building an entire lab filled with amazing STEM things, robots and, and 3D printers. How do you approach teachers who might be a little intimidated by the word code or program or any of that stuff? Well, what I like to do is I like to invite them into a dance party. And in that dance party, we'll look at a dance like the Cupid Shuffle, and we'll look at with a group of kindergarten and first grade students how that dance is really a sequence of moves that are repeated in different blocks. And we'll talk about how we can represent that. <clears throat> and We'll do some group representation, we'll write out some code, we'll do some dancing, then we turn the kids loose, they write their own dance codes, and pretty soon they're t teaching each other how to do their own dances because they wrote these codes out on the whiteboards. And usually at about the time the teacher's having a super great time dancing the kids' dances, I tell them, so that's programming. 
I, I, I see that, and I, and I understand. Kasha, how, how do you take that? How, if you were talking to a tech coach or if you were talking to an administrator, how would you recommend that they introduce coding into their, um, I don't want to say curriculum yet, but it's the hour of code. How would you suggest somebody bring it into a teacher who might not be quite there yet? Yeah, I think it's a really good question. Um, we talk about it as having a single input and multiple outputs. So the idea being that there's something that's kind of structured for a teacher who might not be very comfortable um, with teaching coding because maybe she hasn't coded before or doesn't know what programming is or doesn't know the difference between the two. Um, and you know, starting with a, a guide, a facilitator guide, or some structure around how to get started. Uh, and then letting the kids kind of take it um, in whichever direction they want to, like the dance party, and hopefully they all come up with their own output. So you have a single input that's a little more structured, and the kids get to take it in whatever direction they want and be really creative and follow their passions and make basically any kind of dance they want. And uh, for that to be the goal, uh, you know, for that first hour. You know, I like some of the, the things that are out there, especially with Scratch, and we're going to do a whole Scratch demo in a few minutes here. A lot of the resources on code.org are visual, they're bright, they're created for, you know, younger kids of, of all grade levels, but there's something specific about Scratch. You you guys seem to describe this as a type of literacy. What does coding and literacy have to do with each other? Can I take this coding and change it to be a part of any curriculum that I'm working on? Yeah, I mean, that's that's uh, how we see it, at least. We know a lot of art teachers and music teachers who use Scratch to create new kinds of instruments. Um, they're robotics teachers that connect Scratch with the uh, external world, like with different robots or different Lego creations. Um, you know, people used it as almost a, a, a way to present things, kind of like mm -hmm. a modern-day slideshow, you know, and you can do your history presentation using Scratch. It becomes a tool, right, a tool in your toolkit to express yourself, and that can go across all the different curricula. Let me bring Kevin For, in here. Oh, go ahead. Let me jump in real quick sure. here, Jeff. I want to share that uh, yes, earlier today I was walking around in the hallway and the sixth graders were working in STEM class. And they had the laptops and I peer over their shoulder and they're working in Scratch. And what they're doing is they've created an animation. When you press one button, there's some molecules that take up a large amount of space and they move pretty slowly. And that button is labeled gas. And then when they press the liquid button, all the molecules get compressed and behave you know, more energetically, and then when it's solid, they're all slammed tight together. But the project that they had to do was they had to create that animation in Scratch that illustrated their understanding of how molecules behave in different states of matter. So, Sam, <clears throat> let me ask you guys this question here. You know, in my own position, and, and you know, Coding is new to me. Coding is something that I'm learning, and that's why Sam has been wonderful on the Tech Educator podcast to bring on coding topics. We've done a few shows this week even on different coding apps. Recently, Sam, you wrote a blog post on My Paperless Classroom where you opened up your floor and took, what was it, masking tape, and you made a grid on your floor. Blue tape. Blue tape. Very <laughs> clear here. That's blue tape. Could, could you talk briefly about that? Because I, I want to see if I can figure out how to go from that to where Kevin is with fifth grade. What, 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 are, what were you doing there with that blue tape? So when you put a grid on the floor, it's just an organizational system placed over space. When we're programming in a programming app or in a programming language, we have to tell our character how far, or robot or whatever, how far forward to move. With my students, I like to start them on that by having them actually navigate on a grid, and they have to write programs to get themselves from one part of the grid to another. We'll follow that up by having them work with robots that also will run on a grid and have a predictable number of moves. But I've found that a lot of the challenge of programming is just getting students thinking systematically and breaking things down step by step. So if you can do an offline activity where you have a grid on the floor and you put a post-it note on one of the grid squares and you have the students program their friend to get to that grid square, it's a really great exercise in giving directions, writing directions, and breaking things down into smaller units. Not to mention, anytime students are working on a grid, numeracy standards left, right, and center. 
right? We're, we're working in a two-dimensional number line. It's amazing. And Sam, that's also building on communication skills and really that whole idea of thinking as they're getting older, that those skills are going to carry with them all throughout middle school, high school, and on. So what we did, and please give me my report card on this, I took that concept of a grid, I walked into kindergarten this week, where they happened to have a rug filled with rows of color, that a red row and a green row and a blue row. We put all the kindergartners around, and we used that as our grid. And then we had the teacher walk up and do the grid system, and the kids kind of shared where they where things were. We put some roadblocks in, so that way they had to go left, right, turn left, turn right. And I thought that was pretty easy, non-tech coding. We then took it up a step, and I said, all right. I actually reread Sam's blog post, and we went to second grade, where we actually drew a grid on a piece of paper five by five and we took that skill a little bit higher now i want to bring kevin in here but how do you take all those approaches and move it into a fifth grade class well you can start in exactly the same place i mean you have to know your learners right you can't assume that just because students are in fifth grade they're going to know x y and z especially about programming unless you have a robust program they're part of. Um, so with my fifth graders, before we do much with the robots, I've got them out in the play yard here between the buildings. We've got sidewalk. The sidewalk has giant squares on it. So I'll have them code their way from one building door to another just on the sidewalk. Kevin, let me bring you in here. What what are you thinking about all this? I know we were talking earlier before the show, and you're like, I don't know much about coding. I really want to try this. As a fifth grade teacher, where, where are you with all this? Are, do you think this is easy to bring in? Are, are you nervous about all this? Do you have questions? What kind of things are you looking at when you're going, it's hour of code, I got fifth graders, what do I do? Well, I, I love the whole... Uh grid idea of taking that blue tape and, and moving out all the desks in, in the classroom and having the students program themselves or program uh, a friend. I think that's, that's brilliant and uh, really opens up their eyes to the world of programming. Uh, I guess one question I do have with this is with all the curriculum stuff that a classroom teacher has to get through, when do you find time to do the programming, to do the gridding, uh, and how much time is too much time? You don't want to burn the kids out, but you don't want to shorten their time where they're just dying to have more. Uh, so, you know, th those are some, some questions I have right off the bat. Well, and that, and that time concern is a good one, and there's a number of different ways into it. The first is, you know, not all time is equal, right? So, it could be that you are doing some things that take a good amount of time and have a small amount of return that you might be able to transform into a programming activity. Let me tell you the world's simplest like way to create a programming activity is you take whatever work you were doing on a piece of paper on their desk, you blow it up of 200% and you put it on a grid on the floor, right? Um, and you can get programming into just about anything but you can get some really high return if you pick kind of the right things so maybe it's not about giving the kids an hour to play you know this puzzle solving activity online but maybe during the hour of code you for example choose one of the great scratch tutorials from hour of code and you do it with the eye towards doing something like that in the future. Like there's this, this animate your name tutorial that when I look at it, I could see an easy way into maybe a language arts presentation about words and roots, right? So maybe they animate their name now, and this would probably be better for sixth or seventh grade, I don't know. But if you were studying, you know, different pieces of vocabulary that had similar roots, you could animate a word where that root comes up and the suffix comes up and then you have some image display that's related to that word and then one suffix goes away a different one comes in maybe a different prefix comes in and you can kind of animate from one word to the other like what's the relationship between this word and this word we're going to show you in this animation and you're taking as Kasha mentioned earlier you're taking a presentation that you might do 
and you're replacing it with you know a video that or an animation that the kids have created in scratch that is shareable it's embeddable and it's their own creative work and that right there the fact where the point where you give them the ability to create something is transformational in the classroom so the challenge is how can I spend enough of the right time in this that I can get them to that point of creative expression it's not about the hour this week and the games we play it's about getting to that point of creative expression later well Kasha let me bring you in here what advice would you have for Kevin who's looking to do something like this but might not know where to start um yeah well so Scratch is based out of MIT. We've got a bunch of friends in other universities that are also thinking about the ecosystem around Scratch. Um, we have a kind of younger platform for kids who are five to seven years old called Scratch Junior, which is out of Tufts. Uh, and we also have a number of, <laughs> I'm glad you like it. Um, and we also have um, some amazing friends at Harvard who run something called Scratch Ed which is a set of educator resources um, and a community of educators who are using Scratch. Uh, and it's all online, and everything's free, just like everything in Scratch is free. Um, so that might be a really good place to start, just to see what other people have done, see um, how they've also integrated Scratch into their classrooms, and maybe get some ideas and meet some cool people. Well, I gotcha. You'd said you were the product lead. And you know it's interesting. Could you could you spend not not too long? Because it's certainly not the most interesting thing we're talking about today, right? But in the world, like Scratch is, I believe, open source and it's all free. What what work does a product lead do in that kind of a quote unquote marketing environment? Uh, yeah, this is the least interesting question that I've talked about so far. <laughs> far. Thanks, Sam. Um, <laughs> Keep it um, real. So yeah, you know, uh, you invited me on, so. Um, yeah, uh, so when I think about what my job is right now, I'm really focused on the growth that Scratch is seeing and trying to um, make sure that we have an environment that's going to support that kind of growth. And so on the infrastructure side, I work really closely with uh, not, not as many developers as you'd think um, to make sure that Scratch is going to be available. Uh, and that's, cha that's really challenging because we're in a lot of countries and there are, I think at this point, 12 million projects that are shared, 9 million users. I mean, it's it's a pretty large project, uh, and it's really just a research project. So that's one thing that I think about, is just trying to make it so that Scratch is available. Uh, the other thing that we think a lot about is community and how we continue to support Scratch as it grows and make it easy for people to get into Scratch. Um, you know, if a kid is really into hip hop, there should be a really easy path into Scratch that's based on hip hop, because there are tons of kids who are into hip hop on Scratch. If you know someone's really into anime, there should be a path in that's based on anime, uh, and trying to kind of lower that floor so that people can join the community faster. So it's less about marketing, honestly. Like we don't really think too much about that, um, and it's more about just matching the growth and making sure that everything scales with it. Kasha, would you mind giving us a little demonstration of what Scratch is and, and the power that it has? Sure. Um, do you want to see anything in particular? I can show you the Hour of Code page and then walk through a tutorial. I could just walk you through Scratch. Yeah, pick one of the uh, pick one of the Hour of Code pieces and talk about kind of how that experience relates to overall Scratch. So this is the Hour of Code page that we created for this year. Um, the the site is, you know, the normal Scratch annotated edu and then slash hoc for Hour of Code. And what we did this year is we highlighted three different projects that we thought would be a good diversity, um, which we care a lot about on Scratch in terms of interest uh, and the kinds of kids that we um, that that we attract. Uh, and this is the animate your name project that we were talking about. Um, this is a hide and seek game that we did in collaboration with Cartoon Network. We actually got to use a bunch of their assets for one of their shows, which was pretty delightful. Uh, and this is the dance tutorial that I think uh, someone else had actually mentioned. So do you guys have a preference as to which one we take a look at? Let's go with the dance one. <laughs> okay, cool. So I'll open that up. Oh, another thing to mention about um, the Hour of Code page is that I hadn't scrolled down, but if you do scroll down, there are a bunch of facilitator guides and some teacher resources uh, in case you you know need some help getting started. Um, so this is the tutorial. Let me just make this a little bit larger. And this is what we call the tips window. So each tutorial has a little video introduction that uh, you can't hear, but I can very loud. It's a 
video that shows you all the different kinds of dances you can do. And then you can follow step by step and start to kind of, you know, build your own dance here. So if I, maybe I'll do a few of the steps here. Um, for those who aren't familiar with the Scratch interface, this is what we call the editor. Um, this over here on the left hand side with the cat is what we call the, the, the stage. So this is where um, you, know, you play your project. Uh, down below that is your characters, which we call sprites, and also your backdrops um, to the left of that. In the middle, you've got your blocks, and these are your coding components. So for example, I can drag this out here, drop this into the, the scripting area, and if I click it, my cat moves. Um, if I now snap some blocks together, I can make the cat move and then turn. And I can start doing some interesting things like I can change the color effect and maybe throw that inside of a loop, which is the C block here, and maybe have an event that causes all of that to start. So now it says when I click the green flag, forever the cat is going to move and turn and change colors. So I can go over here and click the flag and you can see I've got a very um, dizzying, maybe, dance <laughs> that this cat's doing. So if I, um, that's kind of a, a quick overview of, of the editor. And I can basically follow these instructions on the right-hand side. Um, you know, choose a backdrop, choose a dancer. Uh, Scratch comes with a media library, so you can pick some clip art, basically. Choose a sound, you know, play the music, and you just kind of follow the steps and, and, and do that. Kasia, you, you went to that scratch.mit.edu slash HOC website. From mm -hmm. viewing this, this looks fairly, uh, you know, s simple to use. I, I, am I missing anything uh, where if I wanted to use this with my students tomorrow, they, they don't need a username, they don't need a password, they could just go on and figure things out for themselves. Is, is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. So you can get started really quickly. If you want to save or share the project, you're going to have to sign up. So okay. your students are going to have to have a login. Um, alternatively, so this is online. This is all online. Alternatively, you can actually download Scratch as a piece of software onto your, your local computers. Uh, and then, you know, you can just open it up and play and you can, you can, you know, make a project, you can save it, um, and that doesn't require any kind of a, a login. Now, I saw that you were able to move the cat, you know, 10 steps or turn it 15 degrees. Are those numbers um, changeable? Can, can we change that to, to 5 steps or to 30 degrees? Sure. So there are all kinds of things, if I can find the zero. Uh, yeah, all kinds of things that you can do. Um, and, you know, if you want to do some stuff with X, Y coordinates, you can do those kinds of things. Um, if you want to get fancy and create a variable to keep track of a score, for example, you can also make your own blocks. Um, you can, you know, make a connection to the physical world. Um, there are all kinds of things. And, you know, each one of these categories here is a totally different set of blocks. So there's a ton of stuff that you can do. Very cool. So you've got the, the connector to the we do live right there in the library on your HOC piece. Huh? That's cool. Yeah, so the HOC will just, you know, kick you right into the editor. And the editor is nice. the same. Whether you whether you join from, you know, the home page of Scratch or you come in through the HOC page. Now Scratch will work on which browsers? Will it work on a Chromebook? Um, so Scratch will work on a Chromebook. The extensions part won't work on the Chromebook, but mm -hmm. everything else will. And um, it will also work on any other browser. Um, sometimes we have some, some difficulty with old IE browsers, but I don't think that's just us. <laughs> <laughs> um, excellent. And is there any projected date on Scratch on tablets? That is something we are working very hard on. Um, the, the tricky part is that Scratch is actually written in Flash, which you'd know if you if you took a look at the open source repository. And we are currently trying to move off of Flash. Uh, and once we've done that, we'll be able to then um, you know build that onto a tablet. Now you say move off of Flash, and that's such a simple sentence, but that actually <laughs> involves rewriting all of Scratch, right? Yes, it does. Okay. Yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be quite the fun project. It's a good thing we're based at MIT. <laughs> Without all those smart people, how could you ever get this done? <laughs> um, I am a big fan of Scratch because of its ability to help students tell stories. And I think this aspect of uh, Mitch Resnick, one of the creators of Scratch, talks about this aspect of coding a lot. Uh, but 
I think it doesn't get as much play as it would other in a lot of other situations. I think some people see very quickly, oh, it's got degrees and steps. I know how it relates to math. But when we're looking at language arts integration, um, can you talk about some of the projects you've seen users create in Scratch that um, kind of would fit into a language arts classroom? Yeah, um, I think, you know, an amazing thing about kids, which I'm guessing everyone on this podcast knows about, is that they um, are just little people. And so they're interested in the things that they're interested in. They have passions that are um, about, you know, making friends and shows they see on TV and when their younger brother annoys them and when they want to tell a story. Um, and I think Scratch is a tool that can be used for, you know, to express any of those ideas. So I've seen some pretty amazing stuff on Scratch. I've seen kids... Um, you know, create entire animation series on Scratch or uh, Jeopardy games about history. Um, I've seen kids who make dress-up games who, you know, start to state their opinions on politics <laughs> through different, like, slideshow type of things, um, who uh, solicit, you know, feedback from their peers about how they feel about things that are happening today socially in the world um, and things that affect them. So, I mean, really, it's, it's kind of limitless. Could you talk a little bit more about that last one? How did that work? Um, like everyday top the, the things that they care like about the, today the that feed, are the sliz, uh, yeah getting feedback from their peers yeah I mean pretty much any big thing that's happening in a kid's life is going to appear on Scratch um, so for example um, thinking of some big things that happened this year when gay marriage became something that the general population was talking about kids were also talking about this kind of thing in Scratch. Um, kids will talk about um, their identities, if they're, if they're Christian or if they're Muslim, or um, they'll talk about the TV shows they like to watch and whether they think different characters should be doing different things. Um, they'll talk about subjects in schools that they like and, and subjects that they don't like. Uh, pretty much anything that you can think of kids are talking about on Scratch. So that's really exciting from the standpoint of kids communicating, expressing themselves, as you're describing it, it sounds, you know, like the conversations I have with other adults on in places like Facebook. Um, what do teachers need to do to help their students use that Scratch community in a way that's, you know, that's successful, responsible, and appropriate for school? Yeah, that's a great, great question. Um, anyone who signs up on Scratch has to read through our community guidelines, and we're very, very serious about those guidelines. Uh, and in those guidelines, we have things like respecting each other and giving constructive feedback. Um, and we obviously have a very uh, strong moderation team that's going through and making sure that it's a friendly and respectful place for kids. Um, you know, I think that there's always the option, if a teacher is worried about that, that you can use the offline version of Scratch, which doesn't have a community. Um, what you lose there is uh, the ability for kids to learn from each other, to become inspired from each other, um, and um, to remix each other's projects, which is essentially to see someone's project, think it's really cool, look inside the code, which you can do on any project on the site. Um, so I can see the code that created someone else's really cool game, and then I can, you know, take a copy of that and build off of that and share um, that back to the community. So there are definitely things that are great about the community, but if anyone's nervous about that, you can always use the offline version too. But I also think that that's important for promoting digital citizenship. It really gives another opportunity to highlight digital citizenship in another space. De definitely, Rob. You know, I think we're all kind of moving beyond the digital citizenship model that's based on don'ts. And if we really want to empower students to be members of an online community, we need to get with them in a community and help them be productive there. And it sounds like Scratch is a great opportunity to do that. I know that on our sixth grade team, the lead teacher will create part of a program and put it in there. They have a, is it a clubhouse? I forget the, the vernacular for the, the studio. studio. There you go. So you'll put it in the studio that belongs to that class, and then the students can start from that code. Um, so the community isn't just valuable for the students talking to each other, but it also gives the students and teachers the ability to be connected in that space and give each other the work they're doing. And also build on what they're working on. You know, we always talk about how together we're better and the smartest person in the room is the room, and this really gives the students the opportunity to um, have discussions and build on ideas and really just get that feedback to make it better. Yeah, we definitely see that with um, 
a lot of kids who start and they're into you know one particular thing, let's say anime, and they're doing amazing animations and you know making stories about those animations. And then while people are commenting on their projects and saying this is so cool, they'll check out other people's work and they'll say, oh, I can also you know make these characters interact with each other. And then they start learning that part of the code. Um, and maybe I can also you know create some kind of a game based on that, and they'll learn that kind of code. And so people really do learn from each other, um, you know, based on having that contact and learning about what other people are creating in the community. You know, there's some great things that are going on in the Scratch community. There's some great things that are going on in all of these different sectors of coding and programming. Here's my question to you. What, ha what happens if you're a teacher and you're teaching a specific niche, say history or, or, or any of those subjects that you're not quite sure coding is part of this? How do you bring these skills into the curriculum, into real-world stuff that teachers are living and breathing every single day? Uh, Kasha, what kinds of things can you share so that way a teacher like Kevin can really implement this into his particular curriculum? Yeah, I mean, I think that any time that you're doing um, presentations or some kind of an output in terms of a challenge or an assignment, you could think of using coding to express that idea. So instead of doing a presentation by making a poster board, you know, you could use a Scratch program, or you could write an app, or you could do any of these things. I don't think Scratch is the only is the only alternative out there. Um, if you're kind of lacking for ideas and you feel like, well, European history, you know, for example. I don't know what I would do with Scratch. I think you just go to the Scratch website and search it because I'm pretty sure someone's done something with it before. Kevin, can you come up with any ways, now that you know a little bit about Scratch, of how this might be used in your classroom? Yeah, I teach the, the American Revolutionary War, and I always try to make the, the battles uh, you know, fun for the kids to understand. So using Scratch in the classroom... Uh, you know, we, we could have the Battle of Lexington and Concord, how you have the, the Redcoats, you know, marching towards uh, the, the Rebel Army and how the Rebel Army marching towards, towards the Redcoats uh, and having that first shot go off. And having kids create that type of project using Scratch could really, you know, make it come alive for them and they could really maybe understand it better uh, of, of the, the tense moments before that shot heard around the world. You could even do it with the Battle of Saratoga, where the Continental Army at this time cutting down trees, um, and, and where General Burgoyne and the other British soldiers have to kind of turn around and retreat, and you know, uh, find find a new path. Um, so you know, a, a little history in there. And uh, sorry for boring anyone, but those are just two quick examples that really come to come to my mind, where you could use Scratch and implement that American Revolutionary War, uh, some of those battles. But those are great examples because it just shows that you can use this for any subject. Rob, go ahead. I was going to say uh, I teach eighth grade American history, and I always think back to my childhood of, of Oregon Trail and westward expansion and having kids really create their own adventure using Scratch. Is a, you know, they can make that westward expansion and have different things happen along the way based on the code that they create. Yeah, the uh, it was we were doing something with uh, it was a Gold Rush game, but it was based on Oregon Trail, and it was awesome because, well, the kids didn't finish right, but sometimes just doing two screens right. So there was one team of girls, and they made uh, an entry screen. Choose you know whether you're going to be, you know, Mr. or Mrs. in this family that's going across the country, and then you got to choose your jobs. Right, so they had the subdirectory for the jobs available to the male characters, and the subdirectory to the jobs available to the women, and they had learned very clearly, you know, what the prescribed social roles were, and they were reflected so clearly in all of the choices available for the male characters, and just the, you know, very very few choices available for the women characters. Like that was just awesome to see them do that and really dig into that piece of it. Where do we go from here? And, and I know right now we're celebrating Hour of Code Week, but this isn't the only time that we should be worrying about coding and program. After we get done this, we go beyond the Hour of Code. Sam, let me ask you a quick question here. Where would you go for resources for learning about coding beyond just this week? Well, if I was going to look for something to figure out how to code beyond the Hour of Code, I might check out certainly Scratch scratch.mit.edu amazing amazing stuff the scratch ed harvard project that we that was mentioned earlier really great guidance but even further than that there is beyondthehourofcode.com 
a website for a book that's forthcoming called Programming in the Primary Grades Beyond the Hour of Code. And the whole focus is thinking curricularly about programming. How can this support instruction? How can I use these high engagement tools to reach my highest challenge learning goals? And I think that when we want teachers to buy, you know, buy in and use it more, I think that's what they need. They need to see how it's connected to their curriculum, what they're doing, and they can get creative ways to bring that into the classroom. You know, thinking about going in and using something like this tomorrow, and and you know, I, I Kevin, I'm definitely gonna to check in with you in the next couple of days to see how you're doing and how you're using coding in your classroom. Are there resources out there, and I'm thinking YouTube channels, you know, visuals that a teacher can look at tonight and learn how to do this tomorrow with their class? I mean, we're going to obviously put everything together on our resource pages over on the teachercast.net site, but does anybody have any favorite coding um, YouTube channels or visuals that they might want to recommend? Like I said before, there are a lot of facilitator guides for all three of those tutorials and additional ones that are on Scratch. There's also a creative computing guide, um, which is like a curriculum that's on Scratch Ed. So those aren't YouTube videos. Um, there is actually a scratcher who does a lot of uh, tutorial reviews, and I think that she's like 10 years old. But she's got a YouTube channel that's pretty good. Um, but there's there's a lot of stuff out there, and I think um, you know if you want to get started, checking out the facilitator guide is, is probably a good way to do it. Kevin, what's your game plan? We, we have the night. You're going into class tomorrow. What's your game plan for implementing code in our well, schools? Jeff, be, before I get to, to your question, I just want to jump on, on what Kasha said about that 10-year-old with that YouTube channel. Uh, you know, I think that's a, a really great resource, not only for teachers, but for, for kids to, to maybe watch because if they see a peer uh, themselves doing something uh, like this, that may give them the, the ambition to say, hey, you know, if another 10-year-old's doing this, then then there's no reason why I can't be doing this. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and uh, to, to answer your question, Jeff, uh, you know, I, I plan on, you know, staying up, you know, late tonight, uh, early tomorrow morning and uh, going in on a few hours of sleep and, and implementing this in the classroom tomorrow, even if it's just for, you know, 15, 20 minutes, uh, just to get, you know, the, the kids' feet wet, make them excited uh that you know uh, that it's Friday and then make them come back to school on Monday and we do a little more coding. Nice, nice. I definitely look forward to stopping by your class and seeing all the great stuff that's happening. It's always Ga a fun time when you're there. Guys, I know we can do another couple hours of coding and, and, and certainly everyone's welcome to come back on the show. I want to do a little round robin here. Tell us a little bit about where we can find you, some of the great things that's happening. Uh, Rob, let me start with you. Where do we learn more about the great stuff that's happening in uh, Rob Pennington world? Uh, well, you can follow me on Twitter, Rob Pennington 9 or you can go to robpennington.weebly.com. ton of great stuff that I'm doing with my kids. Also some resources for tech coaches that are there, and that's where you'll find me doing different things. Excellent. Kevin, where can we find you? You can find me on, on, on Twitter at uh, Mr. KD24. Uh, that's Mr. KD24, and um, that's really all I am right now. I'm... Uh, starting my, my own blog. Hopefully that's up by, by January, but right now, Mr. KD24. Nice. Sam, where can we find out more information about the great work that you're doing? You can find me on Twitter at S-A-M-P-A-T-U-E. My blog is mypaperlessclassroom.com, and the newest place is beyondthehourofcode.com. Nice. Kasha, thank you so much for coming on. Scratch is an amazing platform. It's an amazing program for kids of, of you know uh, all ages really to get a chance to learn about coding learn about programming one more time where can we learn about it where can we dive in to become pro programmers on scratch yeah so the scratch website is scratch.mit.edu um, you can also google scratch junior if you want to learn more about that that's the younger kids platform um, and also uh, Scratch Ed out of Harvard, which has the educator resources. Um, Scratch has a, a Twitter feed. Uh, you can find us at, at Scratch. And uh, to find me, I guess, you can go to Scratch, and you can find me at, at Petricord, which is P-E-T-R-I-C-H-O-R-D, and on Twitter at uh, K-A-S-C-H-M. 
Nice. And thank you so much for joining us today on TeacherCast Podcast, episode number 124. We really appreciate it. If you have any questions or if you'd like to provide any feedback for our show, you can, of course, find us on Twitter at TeacherCast. Leave us a voicemail over at TeacherCast.net slash voicemail. Email us at feedback at TeacherCast.net. And we love it when you subscribe to our audio and video channels over on TeacherCast.net slash iTunes and TeacherCast.net slash YouTube. Once again, thank you for making TeacherCast your home for your professional development. My name is Jeff Bradbury, and until next time, keep up the great work in your classrooms and continue sharing your passions with your students.